Hello. So I wanted to hop on and do another quick video. This will not be a long one either, like I did the other day. I'm just gonna title these Getting in the Word because um, I just wanna kinda share some things that the Lord is showing me as I read through the Bible. We all can read and get revelation, even with stories that we've read many, many, many times. Every time we get in and read them again, God can show us something brand new. That's why his word is alive and that's why his word is active because it does that. It has the ability to speak to us right where we're at and show us exactly what we need to see at the time we need to see it. So we may have read through these stories a year ago and they spoke one thing to our life and then we read through them again and they speak something different to our life. So I just want to kind of share with you, take you along the journey with me and show you some of the things that the Lord is showing to me. Um, and I, I hope you enjoy some of the things that he shows because uh, he's really opening my eyes to a lot in his word. And I just want to read this. It's in Luke chapter 7, and it's going to be verses 36 through 39. And I read the amplified version. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house in the region of Galilee and reclined at the table. Now there was a woman in the city who was known as a sinner, and when she found out that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began wetting his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head, and respectfully kissed his feet as an act signifying both affection and submission, and anointed them with the perfume. Now when Simon, the Pharisee who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a notorious sinner, an outcast, devoted to sin. There's so much in this, in this one small story that we can reflect on. Um, some of the things that really stood out to me was it was not a shock to Jesus who she was. Of course he knew who she was. Of course he had discernment. He knew exactly who she was. Just like he knows exactly who we are. He knows exactly what is in our heart. He knows exactly what our motives are. He knows exactly where we've come from. He knows everything that we've ever done, everything that we've thought of doing. And regardless of that, he chooses to love us. And it's not because we're these great people. It's not because we deserve it. We are very unworthy and we don't deserve his love. We don't deserve his favor, but it's because he is love. He doesn't just have love, he is love. He is the epitome of love and he pours that love out on us. And when we come to him and we surrender and, and we bow at his feet, she was in, she was in a stance of surrender. When we do that, he can wipe away everything. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. It doesn't matter who we were. What matters is when we get to the place where we bow at his feet and we see him for who he is. She saw him for exactly who he was. Here the Pharisee was, he was the religious person. He was the one that should have been able to see that Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. He knew the word better than that woman could have known. I am absolutely for sure of that because the Pharisees and the scribes, they studied the word. They knew what the word said. And they were men and she was a woman. Of all people, he should have been able to see exactly who Jesus was. But in his heart, he was looking at Jesus and he was judging him. And he was saying he misses the mark. But here this woman is who has had a life full of sin and she's able to see Jesus for who he really is. The word says she had, where is it at? When she found out that he was there, she came and sought him out. She knew who he was and she knew who she was. There's no way she didn't know what she had done. She knew that she was unworthy and the tears flowed. And I think about how many times do we count other people out? How many times do we see people in the church or, or wherever and they're trying to do something for the Lord? They're trying to help other people. They're trying to minister. And we look at them and we judge them on their past. We say, wait a minute, who are they to teach anybody? 
Who are they to lead anybody? I know what they used to do. I know who they used to be. Who are they? We do the exact same thing. But when Jesus comes and he forgives, who are we to judge what people used to be and who they used to what they used to do? God can use anybody. And I think we do the same thing to ourselves many times. We we even count ourselves out because we look and we say, "Oh, but Lord, you don't know how bad we've been. You don't know who we used to be. How could you call me to help anybody? I can't help anybody because they know who I used to be. And we can get sidelined even before we get in the game because we're counting out who we used to be, counting ourselves out because of who we used to be. And I just want to encourage you today, just like Jesus knew who she was, he absolutely knew who she was. He didn't say, stop, get away from me. Your sin disgusts me. Your sin is causing you not to be able to touch me. That's not what he said. He fully welcomed her. That is who he came to save and set free the sinners, the ones who need him most. It's not the people who act like they have it all together. Yeah, he's there for them too. But when we are fully broken and we come to him and know we're unworthy and we know who we are, who we've been, what our heart's been, and we know who he is, that is what he can use. He can use our brokenness and he can use our humility and he can use us knowing exactly what we've come from. Because it's when we get to the place where we forget where we've come from that we start getting self-righteous and we start thinking, oh, I have it all together. Look where I'm at, look what I've done, look what I'm doing, look what I offer, look what all I bring to the table. But if we stay in a place of, Phew, I know I'm not worthy. I know that he picked me up out of the gutter. I don't know why he chose me. I don't know why he put his love on me because I know who I was. When we stay in that place, that is what he can use because then he can flow through us and everything that comes through us is him. We don't get in the way. We start getting in the way when we start thinking, oh, I'm really smart. Oh, I really did well writing that, or I really did well saying that, or, or I have it all together, or, or I, people are drawn to me. Anything, anything that focuses on me, that's where we block him flowing through us. Where he can really flow through us is when we are the woman at his feet crying and saying, Lord, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. I am not worthy. That is the place where he can use us because then he can flow through and everything will always point back to him. We're not the ones sitting at the table looking and saying, oh, I know who she is and she's not worthy. Mm -mm. We're the one kneeling at his feet. We're the one crying because we are so in awe that he could, could possibly love us. When we come to him in that place of humility and stay in that place of humility, that is where his anointing flows. That is where lives are changed and not just ours, but the people around us. That is what people are drawn to. That sincerity, that realness. We don't have to have it all together. We're not going to have it all together. And if we are always trying to wait to come to the Lord when, until we get it all together, we'll never come to him. If we are so waiting, if we are waiting to submit to God, to where we're at a place where we think we need to be, we'll never submit. No matter where you're at, I don't care if you are at your lowest at this moment. If you are in the depths of sin, if you are in the depths of shame and guilt and condemnation, all of those things, now is the time to come to his feet. Now is the time to pour yourself out and he will not turn you away. He will not say, get away from me. He will take those tears and he will wipe them away and he will forgive you he will clean you up and he will set you in right standing with him because that, the brokenness that's where we need to all be it's where we need to get because we in and of ourselves have very very little ability and if we could come to the place of understanding that and knowing that that our ability flows through him our character flows through him the good in us flows through him it is absolutely true when we decrease he increases 
And that is the place where we need to be walking every single day. And, you know, there's another story of sitting at the feet of Jesus that really, really sticks out to me. And it's Mary and Martha. And if you followed me for any amount of time, you've heard me talk about it, I'm sure. Um, there's two. There were two sisters. They were Mary and Martha. And you can also find the story in Luke. It, that's where it's at. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But Jesus came to their house. And Martha was really busy getting everything ready. She was doing everything right. She was getting uh, the meal prepared for Jesus and the people who were there. But Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And... It says she was learning from him. So that is two stories in the Bible about two different women from two different, totally different backgrounds sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I look at both of them and I see the power in really being in the position of sitting at his feet. If we could really get there and stay there, I 100% believe that's where we belong all of the time. That is a place of surrender, and that is a place where we are learning from Him, where we are growing in Him, and it's also a place where we're recognizing who we are. From these both stories, the woman with the alabaster box, she recognized who she was. She recognized her brokenness and his, his, who he was. She, she saw through his humanity, and she saw the Son of God. She knew who he was. And if we can really get to that place where we know who we are and who we're not and who he is and who we are through him, that is the place where we will walk in peace. That is the place where we will walk in joy. That is the place where we will live the abundant life that Jesus said that he came to give us. In my opinion, abundance doesn't mean houses it doesn't mean cars it doesn't mean the greatest job it doesn't mean status what is abundance what abundance does he did he come to bring us in my opinion it's his joy it's his peace it's his fulfillment it's his calling on our life us truly walking in our calling it's his identity it's us walking in the identity that he's given us fully it's walking in his authority knowing who we are in him not being beat up by the enemy anymore not being victims to the enemy but being able to walk in that identity that he has put on us and not being a punching bag for the world and for the enemy and for every circumstance yes things will be hard yes life happens yes we live in a fallen world but when we are really walking in him our focus shifts to him and when our focus is on him the storms of life begin to fade away they're still there they're not going anywhere because we live in a fallen world and we live in a world with the enemy who hates us and we live in a world where we make poor choices there's so many times we just live in the consequences of things that we've we have um, decided to do so yes those storms will still be there but when we shift our focus to him they're no longer what they used to be. They used to consume us. They used to take us over. They used to take all of our focus. They used to take all of our energy. They took some of us years of our lives. Years. I lost years. Years. But my focus has changed. Does life still happen? Absolutely. Things come up all the time. Things that I wish didn't come up, come up. But I'm not honing in on them I'm choosing to say yeah life happens but my focus is on him and when we get to that place other things just don't seem as important anymore it's not that they don't happen they just don't seem as important anymore so I just want to encourage you get to a place where you're sitting at his feet there is no other place that I would rather be than at the feet of Jesus both knowing who I am in him knowing my brokenness knowing my insufficiency um, you know, I, I used to, and I know where the idea comes from, you know, the I am enough, we are enough, those types of things. I know where that comes from. It is trying to help build people's self-esteem. I get that 100%. I have a background in, as being a therapist, I understand where that's coming from. 
But I also understand that we are not enough in and of ourselves. We were not created to be enough. We were not created to do it all, be it all. We just weren't. We were created to have relationship with God. We were created to have communion with God. We were created for him to flow through us. And when that that is not, when there's a blockage there, for whatever reason, no matter what's causing it, that is where the frustration comes in. That is where the anxiety comes in. That is where feeling like we're just not living the way that we need to be living. Because when we are relying on ourselves, I did it for a long time, for a very long time. It it creates frustration. It creates feeling overwhelmed because we're never enough and we can never make things happen. We can never be enough. We can never get it all done. We can never make the connections that God can make. We can never heal ourselves the way God heals us. We can never open the word and have revelation in and of ourselves without God and without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus Christ. Anything we're trying to do on our own can lead, have the potential to lead to frustration because we aren't enough in, of, in and of ourselves. We have to have him. We have to have connection to him. We have to have him flowing through us. We have to have the mind of Christ. We have to be being renewed by Jesus. And the place, in my opinion, where that starts is sitting at his feet. Everything you have need of, everything I have need of, we can find sitting at his feet. How, what does that look like? Like, what am I even talking about? Yeah, it's in the stories, but what does that look like for us? What I do, I close my eyes and I say, Lord, I am sitting at your feet. I am taking, and sometimes I sit in the floor. Sometimes my face is in the floor. And I, I come to him from a posture of, you are all. You are all in all, and I am not. And whatever you want to teach me, whatever you want to show me, whatever you want to do in me, and whatever you want to say, I'm at your feet to hear from you. Those are times that I'm not praying through my prayer list. Um, I'm not asking for a lot of things. Yes, prayer for other people is very important. I'm not negating that. Prayer for our own needs, of course, is important. That's not, that's not that time when I'm sitting at his feet. When I'm sitting at his feet, I am there to hear from him. I may say a few things and then I'm there to get silent and say, Lord, what do you want to say? Just like Mary sat at his feet being taught by him, we can sit at his feet and be taught by him. I love to have a journal with me and then I love to just ask him, excuse me, ask him questions or I love to just talk to him and then wait to hear what he says. There was a time a while back he told me, that when I am at his feet, that is, and not just me, this is for any of us. There is nothing special about me whatsoever. Everything I talk about is for every single one of us. When we are at his feet, that is the time that the intimate relationship with him is built. That is where he pours his anointing out. That is where he brings revelation. That is where he brings teaching. And for my life, there is just nothing like those times with him. And I just want to encourage you to take that posture, no matter what you're going through, no matter where you're at. No, you may tell me, but you don't know how far I've got from the Lord. You, you couldn't be worse than this woman that I just read the story about. She was known in the entire town for her sin. She was known in the entire town for how far she had fallen. Everybody knew. But Jesus did not turn her away. He welcomed her in. And the same way that he welcomed her in, he will welcome you in. It does not matter what you are in the middle of. Drop it and run to his feet. That's all. Run to his feet. And he will be right there waiting for you with arms wide open. It does not matter where you've been in life. It doesn't matter what you've said, what you've done. Run to his feet. And maybe you're a Christian and... You're not living like this woman was, but you are in a place of being stagnant or you're in a place of an extreme battle or you're just not living out the calling that the Lord has on your life. Maybe it's been years since you felt his presence. Maybe it's been years since you've heard his voice. Maybe the cares of life have really stolen your relationship or maybe 
whatever you're going through has taken your focus off of him and it's been on the battle that you're in. Run to his feet right now. Run to his feet. It's not too late. And it's not too late. It's not too late. The time is not too far gone. He wants to hear from you and you can still hear from him. So many times we feel like we get to a place of, well, the Lord just isn't speaking. He's not going to speak to me. Um, it's never going to be like it used to be. I'm just going to live where I'm at. But I want to encourage you, shake yourself and wake up from spiritual sleep. You know, we can fall asleep so easy spiritually. It's a gradual decline into slumber. But once it happens, it's very hard to wake up. And so I just want to encourage you, let's take a real look at ourselves. Are we awake spiritually? Where are we at spiritually? Are we awake or are we asleep to the things that are going on around us? Have we started falling into old habits? Have we started um, loosening up on the things that we believe? Where are we at? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the story about Lot and he pitched his tent in front of Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know which one, I'm sorry. I, I don't have the story right in front of me, but you probably know what I'm talking about. And he faced it towards the city. We don't know how long it took for him to go from his tent outside the city to being at the city gate, which was a place of prominence. He wouldn't have been at the city gate if he wasn't accepted by the people in the town and if he hadn't accepted them and if he hadn't of, um, been in communion with them, friendship with them. So he went and the city was so full of sin and so full of everything that was anti-God. So he goes from traveling with Abraham, who was known as a man of faith and who followed God with his whole heart to being outside the city, but facing his tent towards the city. I don't know what enticed him. I don't know what pulled him. I don't know if he thought he was strong enough to withstand. I have no idea what was going on in his mind, but I do know there was a period from facing the city to him being in the city and living there and being active in the city. And I think so many times we can do that. We can be at a place where we are on fire for God. We are full of faith. We are full of action. We are just on fire. And then something happens. And we pitch our tent. And we, we get stagnant. But we're facing something. We're looking at something. Maybe we're looking back at the past. Maybe we're looking back at old bondages, old habits. I don't know. Whatever it is. And pretty soon it doesn't look so bad anymore. Pretty soon we start second guessing ourselves. Well, maybe we've just been too strict in our lives. Maybe that's not that bad. Maybe it's okay if I just get in, but don't fully immerse. And before we know it, we can be in way over our head and we may not even recognize the person we used to be. Been there, done that also got lost in it for a lot of years. I still loved God. I still prayed, but I let things come into my life that I would have never let come in before. But I let the circumstances take my eyes off the Lord. I let my physical pain and my emotional pain put me in a place that I, I, I just was not spiritually awake anymore. Um, and that can be easy to do. You know, life, Life can be hard. Life can be very hard. But if we're not careful, we will get tossed with the currents of life and end up on an island that we were never meant to be on. So how do we remedy that? What do we do about it? What, it, what am I saying to you if you are looking around your life and you're saying, wow, I think I'm spiritually asleep? Run to his feet. Run to his feet. And tell him, Lord, take a real look at my life and Help me take a real look at my life. Show me my life through your eyes. In a moment, he can fix it. In a moment. Now, will everything be wonderful and great? No, we still have to live with the consequences of our decisions. And we still live in a fallen world. But our perspective changes. 
we change. Our circumstances may not change at all. They can. God's God. He can do anything. But our circumstances may not change. But we change. And we are the ones that need to look at life differently. We are the ones that need to be awake. We are in a time where the enemy wants us asleep. He does not want us active for the Lord. He will sing every kind of lullaby to keep us in our slumber. He will do anything he can to keep us lukewarm. I don't know where we're at in the line timeline of history, but I feel like we are so overwhelmed with the enemy and with darkness and with deception and with lies and um, just with all kinds of bad stuff. Now is the time to wake up. God is waking his church up. I talk to people all the time that are being reignited on fire for him. That are being re... I don't want to say recalled because his callings never go away. But that maybe their callings have been dormant for a while because they've allowed them to go dormant. And he is just reigniting them. Now is the time to get in the battle. Now is the time. These are exciting times. Yeah, the world looks like it's gone crazy, but God hasn't. God is still on the throne. God is God. And these are exciting times to get in with him. We can so easily allow circumstances to take our entire focus to where that's all we can see. And we're not even in the battle anymore. But I just want to encourage you, get your eyes on him and get in the battle. Find out what he wants you to do. And in the midst of all of that, our circumstances change. Things start falling into place. Stuff starts falling off. Bondages start breaking. Because when we're in his will and we're doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing, that's where things start changing. So thank you for joining me. I have no idea when I'm going to pop back on um, for these little snippets. These are just things that the Lord is showing me in his word. And I just want to share. Um, I just feel like we need to be talking about his word. We need to be speaking his word. We need to be reading his word. And we need to be talking about it. If you are available tonight, I am doing a live with my dad at 530 my time, which is in Texas, 630 in Tennessee. So whatever timeline you're on, you can check it out and see. We are gonna. He's going to be talking about the glory of the Lord, and I'm really excited, and I can't wait to see you all. Have a great night. Be blessed.